chapter 13, verse 1. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Take a seat. May 1940. The British Army is trapped on the beach at Dunkirk on the coast of France. 338,000 soldiers are about to die. They have been in retreat. The Nazi army has been on its blitzkrieg advance all through Europe and France, and there is literally no way out. Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of England, in a memo to Parliament, is gearing up for the, quote, annihilation of the British army, end quote. The last line of defense between England and invasion by the German force. Then, on Friday, May 24th, Hitler issues a baffling order to his generals to stop their assault. Historians are still perplexed by this and have no idea why, because this one decision arguably changed the outcome of the entire war. The German tank division stops just 10 miles from Dunkirk. Then the city is enveloped in a strange mist that's a mix of fog and smoke, and the German Air Force, because of that, cannot bomb the soldiers who are sitting ducks on the beach. Then even stranger, the English Channel, some Brits at this church, there's actually a lot of Brits at this church, I don't know why, I have no idea why, but... Uh, you know, the English Channel is notorious for high winds, choppy water. It is perfectly calm for three days straight. One historian I read said, quote, like bath water, which makes it possible, most of you know this story, for thousands of small civilian boats to cross the channel and rescue all the soldiers. This story was made famous yet again in 2017 by Christopher Nolan's film Dunkirk. When that movie came out, I was actually just by happenstance in London on a work trip with my son. And so we came, when we got home, we saw it in 70 millimeter for all you people in the room. We're cool like that. But there we saw it in IMAX and I will never forget that feeling. I mean, I'm used to America where everything is like a flight away. I mean, in Europe, everything is so close. I remember sitting there in central London. This is just like three hours away. It, is, it would have been terrifying. You could just feel it in your gut in the movie theater. Beautiful film, but what's not in that film is that also on Friday, May 24th, King George, upon hearing the news of the impending invasion and the annihilation of the British army, called the nation to a day of fasting and prayer. This is an old grainy photo of Westminster Abbey in central London with thousands of people on that Friday lined up outside waiting just to get in for a few moments and plead for God's mercy. Just hours after the king called the nation to pray and fast, Hitler ordered his tank division to stop. And over the next three days of ongoing prayer, all 338,000 troops were saved, the outcome of which changed the course of the war. That generation did not call it Dunkirk or the Battle of Dunkirk, as historians call it today. For decades, that generation all called it the miracle of Dunkirk. Now, was it a miracle or just a coincidence? God's response to prayer and fasting or just like bad military planning with a megalomaniac at the head of a nation? I don't know. But I know this for sure. All through the library of scripture, prayer and fasting go together. You can pray without fasting and you can fast without praying. But when you combine the two, it is like there is a chemical reaction that amplifies the power of prayer. Now we come to number three of the four major reasons we fast in the way of Jesus. In week one, we covered to offer ourselves to Jesus. Last week was to grow in holiness. And next up is to amplify our prayers. 
Now, if you're new to following Jesus, prayer is not a scary word at all. It's just an umbrella term in the library of scripture for the medium by which we communicate and commune with God. And you can break all of prayer down into three, or I'm sorry, two very simple categories, listening to God and speaking to God. Fasting is a powerful practice that amplifies both God's voice to us and our voice to God. Put another way, fasting is a way to hear God and to be heard by God. A word on each. First, to hear God. Here in Acts chapter 13, if your Bible is still open, is one of many fascinating stories about the interrelationship of prayer and fasting. Again, verse one, now in the church at Antioch, this is just north of Israel, and a key kind of city in the growth of the Christian way throughout the Roman Empire, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, likely from North Africa, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who'd been brought up in the, actually the house of one of the leading politicians of the day, and Saul, same figure, who is later renamed Paul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, spoke to them in some mysterious way, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them, which if you've ever read the book of, the, of Acts, it's the whole rest of the book. It's what they historians call the missionary journey. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Notice one simple thing. It's as they are fasting that the voice of God comes with clear direction. This has been my experience, along with I'm sure many of you in the room and countless other followers of Jesus. In times of fasting and prayer and waiting on God for direction, that's when we are most likely to hear God's voice. Uh, just the other day, a good friend of mine was on a four-day fast for his business, kind of just uh, at a, at a kind of decision point in his journey. And as he was in prayer and fasting, a kind of creative possible solution came to his mind for his business. And on the last day of the fast, an old colleague called him up out of the blue and suggested that exact same idea to him. He took that as God's direction over his life. And it was while he was in prayer and fasting. That's one of eight gajillion stories, major and minor. Now, why is that? Well, Let's, this may help, it may not, but let's take a step back for a minute and talk about what's happening again in our body when we fast. We are chipping away in this practice at the false dichotomy between the material and the immaterial, or you could say between the physical and the spiritual. We do not exist in separate categories. You're not like a relational being now and then an emotional being and then a mental being and then a spiritual being and then a physical being. You're just you. Pope John Paul's idea of a theology of the body. Your body is a part of who you are. And so I find it helpful to think about what's happening in my body when I fast. In the last session, we covered some of the ways that fasting is good for your physical health, but it's also very good for your mental health. Peer-reviewed studies on fasting have demonstrated that fasting increases the blood flow to your brain, causing you to be more alert and aware compared to eating, which causes blood to flow to your digestive system, which is why we sleep so well at night. And it's why we are tired and lethargic and a bit cloudy of mind after like Thanksgiving dinner. Like none of us are like, we just do our best work at like <laughs> right after Thanksgiving dinner. It's like, oh man, I'm writing a novel, look at me. None of us, right? Your blood's all down there in your belly. It also increases neuroplasticity and the ability for your brain to make new neural connections and forge new neural pathways of imagination. It's also proven to decrease the neurotransmitters that signal anxiety and depression and increase those that cause or elevate calm and a sense of well-being. It's been proven to increase what doctors call interoception, which as I understand it is your ability to perceive what's happening inside your body and your mind itself with increasing degree of accuracy. It's even been shown in some studies to arrest or even reverse the effects of Alzheimer's and other memory-related disorders. It comes as no surprise that fasting is not an exclusively Christian practice. While the first recorded story of fasting is, as I said a few weeks ago, of Moses on Mount Sinai in the Torah or the Old Testament, 
It's later adopted by Confucius in China, the yogis in India, pretty much all of the Greek philosophers. If you've ever read the Stoics or Plato or Aristotle, they are all staunch advocates of fasting. Plays a central role in Islam, as you would likely know, not to mention the explosion of popularity of intermittent fasting among those in the health and wellness community today, or it's practiced by writers and intellectuals for many years due to its effect on mental prowess. Because fasting is a way of honing your mind to a point of alertness, focus, and increased perception. Now, to repeat, if you're new to fasting, you're like, bro, that was not my Wednesday. Um, (laughs) This does not happen overnight. At first, you may just get a headache or feel like dizzy or a little woozy. But if you stay, and everybody's body is different. There's no one-size-fits-all approach here or experience. But if you stay with your practice and make it a regular part of your rule of life, then it's very likely that your body and your central nervous system will adapt and that when you fast, you will feel calmer, more grounded, more uh, joyful often, and far more alert and attuned. You can easily see how all of this would put your mind and your body and your heart into an ideal state to hear God speaking to you. Not to mention that when you fast, you have a lot more time. One of the first things you realize when you begin fasting is just how much time and energy and mental attention and creativity and choice architecture and money goes to food. Meal planning, grocery shopping, cooking, eating, ordering off the menu, walking, talking, cleaning up, you get a lot of kind of headspace back when you fast. Here's Priscilla Schreier on her practice of fasting. I'm able to gain perspective, she writes, on how unbalanced is the amount of time, energy, and effort that I put into my body versus my spirit. When we choose to sacrifice a need of a body to place more importance on a need of the spirit, God himself sits up and takes notice The heavens are open to us in a way that might not have otherwise been. She offers a key insight here. Not only does fasting put us in an ideal position to listen, but it also puts God in an ideal position to speak. Not only is our mind alert and more attentive, but our heart is more likely to be humble and hungry. I think of God's word to Israel through the prophet Joel. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Or through the prophet Jeremiah, you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. Notice, when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Jeremiah doesn't specifically mention fasting like Joel, but he uses that same Hebrew phrase, all your heart. Fasting is one way, it's not the only way, but it's one way to seek God with not a little bit of your heart, but with all of your heart. Think of like you parents in the room. You know when your kids are like, hey dad, can I have a whatever? Versus a like, dad, please, I call on your mercy, right? (laughs) said my kids to me, never, but you know, like, and that has a bearing on you as a parent, as a loving parent, as the level of their desire, of their hunger. Again, it comes as no surprise that all through scripture and church history, there are stories of people fasting to hear God's voice of direction, or what the New Testament writers later call discernment. When my wife and I are facing a major decision, especially in situations where we don't know what to do, which the older I get is basically just all the time, (laughs) we will often set aside a few days to pray and fast. If it's possible, we love to take time in silence and solitude or go on retreat and get away from our phones and noise and distraction just to spend a long time sitting and waiting and listening. But if that's not possible because of parenting or work responsibilities or life responsibilities, we just get up early. And all the time that we would have spent on food or eating or sleeping to digest all the food we have been eating, we just give over to listening prayer, just to sitting quietly, 
our mind and heart open to the voice of God, waiting to see if a word or a thought or a sense or a perception comes up that we discern is the voice of God. Often praying with the psalmist is one of my favorite prayers in all of the Psalms, 143. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. It's from Psalm 143, beautiful psalm. If you're new to prayer, new to scripture, pray that. This discipline of fasting and listening for God's voice is a part of the larger, kind of a larger movement in the spiritual journey that I would define as the shift from decision-making to discernment. Decision-making is, you all know what decision-making is. It's when you, you know, make a pro and con list, literally or, you know, figuratively, and you do the math and you calculate your best guess at which option will maximize the good and minimize the bad. Or what was Nietzsche's line? Maximize pleasure, minimize pain. Like we all have a little Nietzsche in us. Hopefully not a lot, but we all have a little in us. And decision-making is not bad. We make decisions every single day about what to eat for lunch or what T-shirt to put on or who to hang out with that weekend. But discernment is different. It's not asking which option is most likely to increase my Western definition of success. It's asking, how do I know and do the will of God? And that's actually a very different question. It has to do with decisions, yes, with your future, with what option you take, but the will of God may lead you toward pain, not away from it, as it did for Christ. It may lead you to the cross, and through the cross to whole new life on the other side. It's the great irony of our culture where happiness is becoming the default like rubric by which we do ethics. Does this make me, and decision making, does this maximize my happiness or not? The narcissism in there is heartbreaking. But there's so many things wrong with that. One, it assumes that we know what will make us happy. Two, it assumes that happiness is the point of life rather than the byproduct of a life well lived. And life is actually about becoming people of love in God. So many things wrong with that. But often, the will of God will lead you through pain and out the other side into joy in time. But all of our life will take on a cruciform shape. So in decision making, you know, you make your pro and con list, you get advice if you're kind of older and a bit more grown up, you get advice from mentors and friends, and you follow your heart like all good LA people do. But in discernment, sure, you do all of that stuff, but you also may go on retreat or go into solitude or just get up early and spend a lot of time listening in prayer. And you get with your community, in particular, trusted friends in the way of Jesus, and you listen together for God's voice of direction over your life. And this shift from decision-making to discernment is part of an even deeper movement in the spiritual journey from control to surrender. From the kind of very millennial, like take charge of your life posture to the posture of Mary. You know her line at the end of the visitation from the angel Gabriel. What does she say? I am the Lord's servant. May it be done to me according to your word. That is the highest echelon of maturity. What does Jesus say at the height of his life? Not my will, yours be done. Fasting is a practice or a discipline or even a habit in today's language by which we open our body and our soul, our whole person, to the Holy Spirit to facilitate these essential movements and shifts deep inside our being. It is a way to hear God. But it's not just to hear God, it's also, secondly, to be heard by God. God hears our prayer whether we are fasting or not. Thank God. But there is something about fasting that seems to amplify our prayers before God. Again, Acts 13, if your Bible is still open, the end of that story, verse 3, so after they had fasted and prayed, and it's unclear in the text, but it seems to be saying that we're reading about 
two sessions of fasting here. One, where they're worshiping the Lord and fasting, and they hear God's voice of direction. And now another, where they fast and pray before they lay hands on Paul and Barnabas and send them off to the work. They fasted to hear, but also to be heard. This is one of the primary reasons we fast. As God said through the prophet Isaiah in one of the most famous passages on fasting in scripture, we'll look at it next week, Isaiah 58. It's so your voice may be heard on high. Or another translation of the Hebrew there is to make your voice heard in heaven. Do you ever feel like your your prayer is just not heard? Like it's just not getting through, like there's some kind of a wall or a blockage or a shield between you and God or you and the answer to your prayer or you and what you really sense is God's will over your life or the people that you love and care about. As the preacher Tony Evans once said, fasting helps us to activate God's power to break through that wall, or as my Pentecostal friends love to say, to pray through all that stands between you and God's plan, purpose, and power for your life and world. Now, we have to be really careful here. Fasting, just to clarify, is not a hunger strike to pressure God to give in to our demands. Like, we are not Gandhi up against the British Empire, like, here we go, no. We are sons and daughters of a loving father. And yet, back to the line from the prophet Jeremiah, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. There is something, and I wish I could explain this better to you. Ask Garrett the Ask Anything Q&R. There is something about the seeking and finding that God really seems to find value in. There's a lot of mystery here. Scripture tells us what? When we add fasting to prayer, there is a higher correlation between our requests and the release of God's power and purposes. Fact. But it does not clearly tell us why, at least not in a very, you know, agreed upon way. Because it's ambiguous in Scripture, different streams of the church have different theories as to why. I forgot to ask after the first service. I don't even know what Vintage's position is. I don't work here, by the way. (laughs) Gare's great. He'll be back next week. He's away at Alpha. This may be wildly incorrect. I do not speak for Vintage. My theory is it's because God is relational. He is a Trinitarian community of love, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, sharing and giving and receiving love, and that love spilling out into creation and the world. His aim is to draw you and I into his inner life of love, and prayer with fasting takes us deeper into union with God. As we said last week, it burns through. The, the old school, like ancient Christian word was purgation, where we get the, like, where later the medieval monks developed the idea of purgatory. It purges, it burns, it detoxifies in our language. It burns clean all that is separating and keeping you and I from deeper relational connection to God from union, the relational distance between you and I and between you and God, it burns clean. Now you may have another take, but while there is a diverse array of theological opinions in the church of Jesus on why some prayers are answered and others are not and what it has to do with fasting, this much is clear. God responds to prayer and fasting. We just know this to be true, even if we don't know behind the curtain all the mystery of it. I think of the story in Jonah chapter 3. This is one of many, where the city of Nineveh, not a Hebrew city, not worshipers of Yahweh, the creator God, but are warned by the prophet Jonah of its coming destruction. And then we read this story. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed. All of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth, a way of kind of ancient way of repentance, When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. There's a play on words that's lost in translation here from Hebrew to English. In the closing line, the phrase turned from their evil ways and the word relented are the exact same word in Hebrew, naham. And it's a word that 
means or can be translated to relent or to repent or to change your mind. The text literally reads, when God saw they nahamed, he nahamed. What does it mean for God to naham? A word that is often translated repent. Arthur Wallace in God's Chosen Fast, our recommended reading for this practice, insightfully writes this. Because man repents in respect to sin, God repents in respect to judgment. Man's change of heart makes it morally possible for God to behave differently towards him, yet acting consistently with his holy character and principles. We often mistakenly assume that God is going to do whatever God is going to do with or without our prayers. But the pattern that you read in all of Scripture is that when God's people pray, and especially when they fast, God responds. Jonah is one such story, but scripture, again, is full of stories like this. King Jehoshaphat, Esther, the church in Antioch, Acts 13, and many more. And yet many of us simply do not believe this. Most of you would likely like, if I were to ask you, do you believe that, you know, God actually listens to prayer and responds? What's the right answer? Most of us would say, yeah, A few of you would be like super nerdy and you'd be like, actually, no, you misunderstand it, like whatever. But most of us would say, yeah. But huge swaths of us, and this is not a you, this is me often, do not actually believe this. Not down, maybe in our head, but not down in our gut. We are hamstrung, particularly in America. This is a uniquely American problem. We were hamstrung by what philosophers would call determinism, by the sense that, listen, what's going to happen is going to happen. You hear it in that American cliche, God is in control. You're like, isn't he? Well, you know how many times that phrase is used by Jesus? You've, re- you've all read that line where Jesus is like, well, hey, everybody, God's in control. <laughs> and then, you know, you've all read in Paul's letters where he's like, point three, God's in control, everybody. And then he throws in a little God is sovereign and what's going to happen is going to happen. No, you don't find that anywhere in the New Testament. Now, that doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that's not language from the writings of Scripture. And so what exactly do we mean by that? What's often missing from a formulation like, hey, God's in control, which is a shorthand way of just saying, hey, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. What's missing from that formulation is, listen, what is in Scripture is the Lord's Prayer, like the central way of prayer for a follower of Jesus. Our Father, who is in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. What's the next line? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We covered this last fall in the prayer practice, but that assumes, that prayer of Jesus assumes that God's will is not being done, which makes perfect sense. I mean, you don't need to be a PhD to figure out there are multiple wills at play in the universe, right? God has a will. God has wisdom and good intentions for your life, for this church, for LA, for the world. All you have to do to realize that God's will is not being done is like walk outside. You don't even need to read the news. You just walk outdoors. Or you don't even know to go outside. Just pay attention to yourself. It's very clear. God's will is not always done. You have a will. I have a will. I don't know how many people are in the room, 600 people. Guess what? They all have a will too. I have three teenagers. They freaking have a will. Oh my God. Gosh, and it is often not my will. There are something like 8 billion human beings, precious Imago days on this planet. Every single one of them has a will. Guess what? They don't all agree with each other. That's why there's literally wars right now raging across the land because different people have different wills that contradict each other. Scripture would tell us, Jesus would tell us, as hard as it is for our materialism mind to get our head around, that the universe is also populated by a vast array of spiritual beings. Again, many of whom are in worship and alignment with the creator God, and many of whom are in rebellion and rejection of the creator, at war in the language of Jesus with the creator God. There is a war of some kind raging You could argue that nature has some kind of a will as we think about climate change and floods and fires and all of the things. All of these wills interact in a very complex and delicate ecosystem of life. So to say, well, God's in control, 
well, okay, but think about where we live. Think about the reality of what we call home. To pray is to join God with your words, with your thoughts, with your body, with your life, and to bend reality in the direction of his wisdom and good intentions. And to pray, you have to believe. James writes very clearly, you have to pray in faith. You have to believe that God at some level responds. Listen to Dallas Willard. I use this quote in our prayer practice, but let me just set it before you again. It's so good. God's response to our prayers is not a charade. He does not pretend that he is answering our prayer when he is only doing what he was going to do anyway. Our requests really do make a difference in what God does or does not do. The idea that everything would happen exactly as it does regardless of whether we pray or not is a specter that haunts the minds of many who sincerely profess belief in God. But it makes prayer psychologically impossible, replacing it with dead ritual at best. Of course, this is not the biblical idea of prayer, nor is it the idea of people for whom prayer is a vital part of life. Do you know anyone for whom prayer is a vital part of life? I know a few people like that. Every time I'm around them, I think of my friend Tyler who was here a few weeks ago. Prayer is a vital part of your life. Every time. I cannot like get coffee with the dude and not just go away feeling like I need to go on a prayer walk right now. <laughs> like it's just a vital part of his life. Every person I know like that, none of them have a deterministic view of the world. None of them are just like, hey, it's what's gonna, most of them are calm, they're not anxious, they're often deeply grounded people, but they have a real sense of agency in prayer, that prayer actually matters and makes a difference in what does or does not happen. Is prayer a vital part of your life? If the answer is no, or like me, for about three days after I hang out with Tyler, or kind of, but not really, or whatever, then one of the best ways to grow your faith and come alive to prayer is to fast and just see what happens. I have to keep this uh, a little bit ambiguous uh, to honor confidentiality. There's somebody in my uh, empathy circle, somebody that I care about, that is not doing great right now, and they're in a rough season. And so, uh, secretly is not a good word, but secretly, um, my wife and I and about a half a dozen of our family and close friends are just started two days ago uh, what we call Fasting Fridays. So we're fasting every Friday for this person, and they don't know about it. Don't tell them. And um, hopefully they will, they will not listen to this podcast, but that's why we're praying for them. They need to... If, <laughs> if they did, they would be... Uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> and uh, so... Thursday night, I texted out a kind of a list of bullet points. Uh, I'm a firm believer. This is uh, something that I've been learning from Tyler and others that has really transformed my prayer, this kind of prayer of just before I like begin asking God to do stuff, I just start by listening to God and asking him, what do you want me to pray? I could make a list of like, you know, my Christmas list for God really quick but what is God wanting to do? What's the spirit groaning inside me? Those prayers, it's like when you pray those prayers, it's like you touch some electric volt of power. And not only are they more likely to be answered, but they're more likely to be in line with God's wisdom and good intention. So, you know, I will just often spend some time listening to God. And sometimes it's like crickets, you get nothing. Other times there's a real sense of pray this scripture, ask for this thing, ask for this miracle, whatever. So make a little list, text it out Thursday night. Go into Friday, it's a busy day, but we're fasting and praying. There were two clear answers to prayer. One was like one of the main things we were asking God for, and it was not like a vague, emotional, like I feel better. It was like a no, concrete thing. I got a phone call from somebody, and it was a concrete open door we were praying for. The other was like a happenstance, ran into somebody at a farmer's market. It was like random. And even me, like this is literally, I've like, typed up my notes for Sunday, sent it into the slide person or whatever. And even me, I'm like, holy crap, this stuff works. Oh my gosh, I'm like surprised. Every time a prayer like that is so shameful on I me, mean, you're like, if you expect more from me, you should. Um, I don't work here, so hopefully, 
Hopefully the other people are more godly than I am. But even I forget, like, this is real. This is not made up. This is not Santa Claus. This is, God is actually here and alive and active and at work. And there is something that happens when we pray and we fast. And now I'm like looking forward to next Friday because I'm like, I just kind of sort of like haphazardly prayed that day. This Friday, I'm gonna like pray, pray. (laughs) And I'm like, who knows what's gonna happen now? Like I'm gonna put my back into it this time, (laughs) you know? All that to say, when it comes to hearing and being heard by God, not only is fasting an aid to prayer, it is an amplifier of prayer and a powerful one at that. On that note, our practice for this coming week is, again, to fast on Wednesday until sundown, focusing your heart on this third dimension, on hearing and being heard by God. Again, you don't have to do this. There may be medical reasons or uh, psychological reasons that you're not ready to do this or need to augment it and practice abstinence or something else instead. Wednesday may not work for you, totally fine. Everything here is invitational. We make recommendations, you make decisions. But the invitation is to join us on Wednesday to fast and to pray. You may need to make a list of what it is that you are asking God to do, not just in your life, but in your church, in your community, in your city, in your world, or really just spend time there listening for God's voice. If you have uh, had the thought at any point over the last few weeks of, man, I would really love to go on retreat and you know, maybe take your day off or a Saturday morning and go up and find a park somewhere, or go camping by yourself overnight or book a room at a retreat center or just get up early and spend three or four hours without your phone or whatever it is. This coming week, if you've had that in your heart at all, would be the optimal week to do that. In particular, if you are right now facing any kind of a crossroads or you just need, and you need wisdom to make a good decision, or more than that, you need discernment, you need to hear the voice of God and his direction over your life. What is the next step for you? What are the gentle invitations of God for you to, in faith, step out into, trusting that even if there's pain along the way, it will lead you through to life in the kingdom of God. This would be an ideal week for you just to spend extra time you know, delete your social media account for the week or unplug your TV or whatever you need to do to just spend a little bit more time listening. Who knows what God will say to you? And many of you, I'm sure, are brand new to prayer. And you're like, I don't know how to, I just like sit down to pray and all I do is like think about all the scary stuff in my life. Wow, you must be really bad at prayer. That never happens to me. Um, no, that's very normal. And this takes time to just learn to hear God's voice, but you will increasingly and intuitively, because if you have been baptized, you have the spirit of Jesus inside of your body. You will intuitively begin to find yourself into this way where you begin to recognize in that flow of thoughts through the front of your mind that we call consciousness. You'll begin to notice these just gentle thoughts, feelings, perceptions, words, phrases, pictures, little short films that play through your mind, sensations in your body, feelings in your heart or your desire. And you will begin to, little by little, notice that feels like it was gently set there by a loving hand outside of myself or deep inside myself. That is deeper in me than I am in myself, as St. Augustine said, and yet is not me, but is my loving Heavenly Father. And you'll find your way into it through trial and error, mostly just through patiently, quietly listening. This week's reach exercise, for those of you that have the energy and are like too type A for all of us or whatever, uh, to go a little farther than that would just be to follow your heart and do a longer fast. That may be overnight, it may be two days, it may be much longer than that. Whatever you feel the spirit is stirring in your heart. And our recommended reading this week is chapters 10 through 15 of God's Chosen Fast, again by Arthur Wallace. But remember, to kind of wrap this up, this must be said. The end goal of prayer is not to get something from God. Um, Not that there's not a time and a place for that. But God is certainly not a math equation or a 
software line of code. And if you put the right formula in through prayer plus fasting plus waiting plus like mindful attention equals boom. Like it does not work that way. Your soul and our life together is so much more mysterious and sacred and beautiful. And I love that it's not a formula because I would hack that formula and I would do it so. I'd do it in like seven minutes every day and be done. (laughs) And it's just not that way. God is not a formula. He's a person. He's not a vague force of power. He is a person who is, happens to be the most powerful being in all of the universe. And so as you draw on him and relate to him and deepen your union with him, you often come into the orbit and the gravitational force of his power and is often unleashed in and through your life and world. But all that to say, the point of all of this is not to get anything from God. It is ultimately to get, quote, God himself, whom you already have who is deposited into you by the Holy Spirit through the self-sacrificial death of Christ who was sent by the Father. That is the gospel of Jesus. And yet so many of us live disconnected from our inheritance, right? If you are a normal American maximalist, your house or apartment is probably full of stuff that just sits there and you forget about. You don't use or you don't actualize May God never be just one more thing that's lost in the rubble of our busy lives. May God be our father, our lover, our first thought in the morning, our last thought at night, our every ultimate desire, the lodestar of our mind when it comes to quiet. May God ever be that for us. May prayer, may fasting, yes, release his power and his purposes into our life and our church and our world, but ultimately, may it release us from ourselves into the love of God. Let's stand together and pray.